Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. In this video, I'd like to talk about language acquisition. How do children learn a first language? And to start out with, let me give you a few basic facts about language learning. First of all, there's no genetic predisposition for learning any one particular language. A baby born to English-speaking parents will, of course, learn English, but the same baby, if it grows up around people talking in Finnish or in Mandarin or in Sinhalese or in Welsh, will acquire any of those languages with the same speed and ease. All human languages are equally easy to acquire as a first language. And not only that, children can acquire two or more first languages with ease. Yeah, uh, Having two or more first languages, that's called bilingualism or multilingualism. And it has been shown that there are strong cognitive advantages to being bilingual. Bilinguals, they have two language systems in their mind. And in order to use one, they have to inhibit the other. So they have to concentrate on one thing and defocus another thing. And you can imagine that this helps in a whole lot of other cognitive tasks. You concentrate on one thing and selectively ignore the other thing. Right. More facts about language acquisition. Um, I said that the process seems to be effortless, really easy and very rapid, so that all essential parts of language, the grammatical structures, the pronunciations, all of that, is in place by age five to six. So their kids talk pretty much like adults. Now, of course, they don't talk completely like adults. They don't have the same capabilities that adults have. Think of telling a good joke or understanding irony. Their kids catch up over the years, but in terms of grammatical rules, pronunciations, knowledge of different words, you know, the basics really are in place by age five to six. All of this happens without formal instruction. You don't have to tell kids, this is right, this is wrong, this is what the rules are. They figure that out by themselves. And interestingly, the outcome is almost always the same. Everybody learns how to talk. And uh, even though there may be some people that talk really, really well, that are super eloquent, that know how to talk in public, um, well, this is a skill that you have to learn as an adult. Yeah? Um, everybody learns instinctively how to talk well enough to hold a conversation. Right. Now there are certain puzzles associated with language acquisition. For one thing, kids say things that they have never heard before. How do they do that? Kids get things right without being corrected. How is that? How do they figure that out? And then they master grammar by age five, but they don't master things that are equally complex, you know, comparable to language, like mathematics, differential equations. Mm, no, they, they have trouble doing that at age 15, and yet at age 5, they chatter away. Yeah, they have trouble tying their shoelaces, but they use relative clauses. That seems to be remarkable. No. Linguists try to explain these puzzles with theories of language acquisition, and in the rest of this video, I'll talk about three such theories. Now, an important notion with regard to language acquisition is the so-called critical period hypothesis. The hypothesis that there is a time window during which language acquisition is easy and automatic, and after that time window, it becomes very difficult, almost impossible, to acquire language with native-like fluency. So sometimes you meet people who speak a second language remarkably well, yeah? But still, there are small telltale signs that tell you, okay, here's somebody who learned this language as an adult, and even though they're really good and know all the words and whatnot, um, you, know, you can tell it's not a native language. Right. Uh, what is the critical period hypothesis? Well, it's essentially a period of brain maturation, a period of brain development, after which language learning is no longer easy and automatic. Can we put a timestamp on it? Can we say this is when the critical period ends? <clears throat> okay, 
the critical period is probably different for different aspects of language learning, but in very general terms, you can move to a faraway place, say at age five, and still acquire the language that you're learning there and pass as a native. Try the same thing at 15 and you won't be as successful. Right. Um, however, there are processes of language learning concerning the learning of sounds that begin much, much earlier than age 15. Um, so there are critical windows of learning certain aspects of language that open and close earlier than that. For instance, um, it's been shown that there's a difference between babies that are around eight months old, eight, eight months old, and babies that are around 12 months old. So babies that are up to eight months old, they distinguish between all kinds of different sounds that they hear, human language sounds, and uh, they've been called linguistic citizens of the world. Yeah, They listen out for all the sounds in their environment. This changes over time. So babies from 10 to 12 months onward, they preferentially listen to sound distinctions that matter in their own language. So with regard to English, that would be something like the difference between P and B, yeah? because that's a phonemic distinction in English. So babies start out as linguistic citizens of the world and they become culture-bound listeners. So you listen out for only things that happen in your own language. How do we know this? Well, there are there are clever experiments done with young children, babies. Um, so let me explain these two pictures here to you. You see that there's a baby sitting on uh, the mother's lap, yeah, and the other adult there with the penguin, that is the experimenter. And both the mother and the experimenter, they have headphones on because they're not supposed to hear what's going on there in terms of sound. Um, I explain this. So you see that the experimenter is holding this Linux penguin, uh, which is supposed to distract the baby. Yeah, so the baby is fascinated by the penguin and the experimenter does little things with it to keep the baby entertained. <clears throat> and all the while, through loudspeakers, there are coming sounds of the kind la, 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 ra, ra, ra. Yeah? Um, and whenever there's a change from ra to la, there's a brief two-second time window in which that black box on the right side lights up and the baby gets to see a panda banging a drum. Yeah, just the kind of thing that babies want to see. And uh, so the baby knows, okay, if nothing happens, then the penguin is the most interesting thing to watch here. But as soon as the new sound comes on, I better turn my head and look at the really interesting panda. Okay, so that's the idea. That's called a head-turning paradigm. Right, what can we learn from an experiment like this one. Yeah, it looks pretty crazy. Um, well, what we can learn is um, if we do this kind of thing with American babies and Japanese babies that are between six and eight months of age, um, the babies get this task right about 65% of the time. And there's no difference between the American babies and the Japanese babies. If we do the same experiment four months later, the American babies become better at the task. They can do it now 75% of the time. It's like they have experience and have learned this uh, task. But the Japanese babies, they become worse. Why is that? Well, it's because in English, the difference between R and L, yeah, R, O, Ra, La, is phonemic. R and L are different phonemes in Japanese. They are different realizations of the same phoneme. And so um, American babies have become attuned to the phonemic inventory of English 
Japanese babies have become attuned to the phonemic inventory of Japanese, and since for them there is no difference between ra and la, they don't recognize it as much. So, here you see the development from linguistic citizens of the world to culture-bound listeners, and this happens very early in life. Right, um, with that in mind, let me take a step back <clears throat> and talk about two different approaches to language acquisition. The approach that I'm going to champion here in this video and in my class is the so-called usage-based view of language acquisition, that language use shapes how you learn language. So children extract generalizations from the language that they hear, um, and that this process is similar how learning proceeds in other cognitive domains. Yeah, So other cognitive skills and social behaviors are acquired very much in the way that language is acquired. This contrasts sharply with the so-called nativist view, the idea that language acquisition is guided by genetically determined innate structures uh, or strategies. So something in your brain, in your mind, is genetically hardwired to let you learn language. Sometimes this is called a language acquisition device. Sometimes this is called universal grammar. Sometimes this is called the language instinct. And in fact, there's a great book by Steven Pinker called The Language Instinct. If you haven't read it, do yourself the favor, read it. Uh, it's a couple years old, but it's still, um, yeah, you can read it with profit. Uh, and even though it's all wrong, it's a very good read. Right. Now, we're thinking about the things that could be innate in language learning. It could be different things. It could be that there are certain linguistic structures and categories, like nouns and verbs, maybe the hierarchical structure of syntax, maybe subjects and objects, verb complements, relative clauses, you know, these linguistic notions, they could be innate, they could be hardwired into your brain. Um, or it could be the case that there are some specialized learning strategies or mechanisms that apply only to language and that are different from those only from those used in other learning mechanisms. Yeah, so that you have a special language acquisition module that doesn't know anything about language per se, but that helps you learn language. Or third, it could be that, um, well, we do have innate things in our minds, but those are general sociocognitive abilities that underlie not only language learning, but also learning in other cognitive domains. And as you will see, I will strongly come down in favor of option three here. It's clear that humans are innately different from, say, chimpanzees or orangutans or dolphins. Yeah, we're different. Um, humans are the only species that has language. But uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that there is something hardwired about language in our brains. And I'll explain how this uh, may work. So, in the next couple of minutes, I would like to contrast three theories of language acquisition that are associated with more or less famous names, namely the names Skinner, Chomsky, and Piaget. Um, Skinner is known for the theory of behaviorism. Chomsky is associated with this idea of universal grammar. And then Jean Piaget has been one of the architects of socio-cognitivist developmental psychology. Yeah, and I have Piaget here because, well, he was born and educated in Neuchâtel. Yeah, that's my current university. And so, um, yeah, it's good to have a local hero here on the slide. Right, let's start with behaviorism. Um, behaviorism, that's a psychological theory uh, that had the goal of avoiding explanations that are somehow, yeah, mentalistic unobservable, unmeasurable. And uh, the goal here was that, okay, let's make psychology in such a way that we're just talking about stuff that we can actually observe, actually measure. Um, so make it scientific. 
That was the idea. And um, behaviorism had a huge success with this strategy, right? Um, so they brought a bunch of rats or a bunch of pigeons into the lab, uh, gave them observable environmental conditions. So one group of rats gets this stimulus, another group of rats gets another stimulus, and then you measure differences in the responses. And uh, depending on what response you get or how many of one response you get, uh, you can make conclusions about what must have happened cognitively. Right. Um, so um, ideas that you probably know from behaviorism are these notions of positive and negative reinforcement. If you give uh, animals a bit of food and reward them, you can you can get them to learn stuff. If you punish uh, animals, you know, you shock them or you deprive them of food, you also get them to learn certain things. Yeah. Now, uh, where behaviorism really went overboard was the idea that language learning would also work in this sort of way. You reinforce, you know, you give rewards and punishment, and that's, that is how language learning is um, reinforced. Yeah. So, for instance, in the babbling stage, when babies are producing syllables, um, it would be the idea that mothers are more likely to reinforce the baby's behavior if the random syllables that the baby produces are similar to real words. Yeah, mama. And the mama goes, yeah, yeah, keep going. And when the baby says something that doesn't correspond to a real word, do di do di do, and the, the mother goes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Also with grammar, you could imagine that ungrammatical utterances might just be ignored or not complied with or punished. Um, so that would be negative reinforcement. And if the child produces a grammatically correct sentence, the mother would go, yeah, very good, very good, keep talking. But none of this happens, none of this happens. So in terms of theories of language acquisition, behaviorism is dead as a dodo. Um, so there's no empirical support whatsoever for any of this. Parents positively reinforce just about any vocalization of a child and uh, negative reinforcement in the form of correction or the insistence of a correct form. That really just happens for something that's very high level like politeness, but not grammaticality. So uh, from behaviorism to universal grammar, which until quite recently was really the main player in the area of first language acquisition. Um, the main claim of this theory is that the structure of language, the structure of what language is like, is really independent of use and is much more abstract than what you see in speakers' actual utterances. So what the child can learn uh, is not affected by the speaker in its environment, the context that it's in, the frequency of use of certain forms, and so on and so forth. It's rather something much more abstract. And um, one of the core ideas would be that language learning is genetically encoded, that in your mind you have a language acquisition device, a language instinct. Um, more concretely, this language instinct is a universal grammar. You know, your language capacity is the same across all human languages. Um, and um, if we ask, okay, universal grammar, what's in there? Okay, answers vary. Um, but at one point, the answer was universal grammar contains principles and parameters. Principles um, are cross-linguistic universals. So for instance, that sentences are hierarchically structured. We have talked about constituent structure in an early video. Um, so all languages have constituent structure. And a second principle would be that um, when you have anaphoric pronouns, pronouns that refer to another referent in the sentence, they must have proper, what's called proper antecedents. Let me explain. Uh, so you can have sentences like Bob likes his coffee black and the word his refers back to Bob. Yeah, Bob and he are the same person. When you have a sentence like he likes Bob's coffee black, 
um, the interpretation that he and Bob are the same people is not possible. And um, so this is because the pronoun is not what's called properly governed. Yeah. Um, again, you can make the case that there are similar things going on across all human languages. So those are principles, cross-linguistic universals. Uh, in addition to principles, one thing that was assumed are so-called parameters, which you can think of as a set of switches that have different positions. So in learning a language, you would already have the switch. You would only have to decide whether you switch it to one side or to the other side. For example, there are certain languages that require subjects to be overtly expressed. So in English, you can't say things like rains or like avocados or hate broccoli. And you would have to say it rains or he likes avocados or I hate broccoli. In other languages, you can leave out the subject pronoun and get away with that. Yeah, everybody does that. Uh, another parameter would be the so-called head parameter. Do heads of constituents go on the left side or on the right side? Um, think, for instance, of relative clauses. A relative clause construction consists of a nominal head, the man, and a relative clause. Who ate my donut? The man who ate my donut. So we have the head first and then the relative clause. Um, some languages like to have the head last. So they would have relative clause constructions like uh, ate the donut who the man. Yeah, Sounds complicated to us. It's not complicated for a speaker of Turkish, for instance. Right. Principles and parameters. Um, okay. How do people come up with this? <laughs> uh, well, a very powerful and suggestive argument in favor of this universal grammar idea is the so-called poverty of the stimulus argument. The idea that language is so complex, it's too complicated for children to learn just from the input that they get, because the input is noisy. Adults, when you listen to them, you know, it's an imperfect source of data. It's distorted all the grammatical errors, the false starts, the hesitations, the uhs and ums. You know, how are you supposed to learn grammar from that? Almost impossible. And then, even worse, the data is really sparse. There's only so much language that you hear as a baby, so there's not enough data to draw solid generations about, okay, when do I have to, you know, care about the sequence of pronoun and antecedent and what they can mean. How am I supposed to figure this out? Um, it looks really, really hard, almost impossible. And yet, kids learn their first language very fast, very accurately, and seemingly without effort. How is that possible? Well, the conclusion is really, they must be relying on something that's innate, that's specifically linguistic, some innate language-making capacity. <clears throat> it's an attractive idea, but, um, well, recent years have seen studies that investigate the poverty of the stimulus argument empirically, and uh, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that the poverty of the stimulus argument has been completely empirically falsified. It is possible to learn language from the input that you hear. The kinds of things that kids say are remarkably similar to the things that they hear. And to the extent that kids play around with language, um, it's really minimal variations over the themes that they hear. Let me show you a slide, namely, um, here somebody counted the utterances that children make during a given time window, and they compared these utterances to earlier utterances that happened in the environment of the child. And you see that more than 60% of everything that a kid says has happened before in this very form. So the big gray bar there, those are one-to-one -one repetitions of things that they've said before or heard before. Then another 25% or so are these minimal variations on a, on a theme. So instead of more noodles, they say more juice. Or instead of give me doggy, they say give me kitty. Yeah? 
So it's not entirely impossible to learn that from the input that you hear. Now, of course, there is some 10% remaining uh, where kids do get creative. And it's worth asking, okay, what's happening there? And the finding is that you know, these creative utterances, they are not exactly indicative of rule learning, so that kids learn a rule and apply that rule creatively, but rather those are utterances that are imperfect and ungrammatical from the perspective of the adult grammar. So there kids play around and tinker with language and try things out and it doesn't really work. So how creative are young children? Not very. Uh, so it's very much possible to learn language from the input. <clears throat> An important term that I want to bring up in this regard is the term pivot schema. Pivot schemas are sort of the constructions of young children. A young, ch a young child's grammar consists of pivot schemas like all x, yeah, all done, all wet, all empty. Where is x? Where is daddy? Where is cookie? Where is mommy? Where is kitty? Let's x, let's go, let's find it, or I'm xing it, I'm holding it, I'm pulling it. Uh, pivot schemas are called pivot schemas because they have a pivot, that's the fixed part, and they have an open slot, that is, there's variation, there's a variable part to the schema. Right, pivot schemas. With that, let me come to sociocognitivism, the theory that I associate with Jean Piaget here. Uh, and the core idea would be that the mechanisms that underlie general cognitive development also underlie language acquisition. So language develops in the same measure as general sociocognitive abilities develop. Now, what are sociocognitive skills? Um, one important sociocognitive skill that you probably know is called object permanence. The idea that an object is still there even when you can't see it anymore. Yeah, so here, can you recognize this? This is a peanut. And uh, now I'm going to do the worst magic trick in the world. A cloth, put it over the peanut, and uh, oh dear, the peanut is gone. The peanut is gone, but of course, um, well, I guess you, you figure this out, right? Um, now there are some living beings who, you know, see the peanut, the cloth, and uh, as soon as they don't see the peanut anymore, they think it's gone. They're not looking for it under the cloth. Kids at around one year of age, they will look for the peanut. Yeah, so it's something that develops in consonant with the um, motor and other cognitive skills in the child. Another important cognitive skill is imitation that you, you know, uh, are able to put yourself into the shoes of somebody else and imitate their behavior. Chimpanzees have a difficult time doing this. Um, okay, two more sociocognitive skills are really important for language learning, and so I want to uh, present them in some more detail, and those are joint attention and attention reading. What's joint attention? So, uh, joint attention, in a nutshell, is the ability to focus on something, like the peanut, okay, together with another human being. So you're available that you and I, we're, expecting, we're inspecting this peanut together. Sounds trivial, but it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Um, before nine months of age, um, children can only engage in dyadic joint attention. That is, they can look at the caretaker and uh, signal to them, okay, we're, we're looking at each other right now. We're engaging in mutual eye gaze. Or they can look at the toy, yeah, and uh, focus on the toy. What they cannot do before nine months of age is alternating between, okay, looking at the peanut and looking at your interlocutor. <clears throat> uh, triadic joint attention, that's the thing, and that means inspecting an object together. Could be the baby's foot, it could be a toy, it could be the mommy's earring, you know, something of this kind. Um, and um, with the ability to engage in triadic joint attention comes word learning. Imagine that you're a baby and you found this interesting thing on the carpet. 
And your mother comes screaming and says, Oh God, the peanut, the baby can swallow it. Peanut, 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 peanut. And you think, Oh, I want that interesting thing. My mommy wants it too. And this word peanut comes up all the time. I guess this is called peanut. And before too long, the baby knows a word, peanut. Yeah. Joint attention. Another important uh, sociocognitive skill is intention reading, the ability to interpret other people's actions as purposeful and goal-directed. If you see somebody uh, shaking, uh, what is that, a yellow egg, yeah, surprise egg, and uh, as a kid you automatically infer that, okay, they want to crack it open, they have something in mind there. Um, this is not trivial. And in the philosophical literature, this often gets discussed under the heading of theory of mind. The idea that other people, too, have ideas, feelings, and knowledge. <clears throat> the opposite of that is solipsism. Yeah? When you're convinced that you're the only living, thinking being on Earth and everything else is a figment of your imagination. Yeah? You all, you guys, don't exist. I'm the only intelligent being on Earth, in the universe. Ah, even the universe, just, you know, I'm making this up. Right, so toddlers clearly have a theory of mind. They imitate actions of others, but only those that they see as successful and goal-directed, not those that they see as accidental. Yeah. Right, <clears throat> intention reading. In the rest of this video, I want to talk a bit about developing language. Um, how does language develop in young children? Um, generally, I'd like us to distinguish four different stages. Um, the first active stage of language production is the babbling stage. Um, this happens from around six to eight months. After that, there's the one word stage a stage in which children produce single word utterances um, that happens around one year of age with the onset of joint attention by the way um, then third comes the two word stage that's quite a bit later from around 18 to 20 to 24 months old um, if you have children that are older than 24 months and are still in the one word stage don't worry there are great individual differences and uh, you know it's fine. There are late talkers. Don't worry. They all learn to talk. And then the last stage, the fourth stage, that's the multi-word stage where kids go beyond two words. Interesting bit is that similar stages can be observed in all human languages. And uh, so, for instance, no language has a three-word stage. Yeah. One word stage, two word stage, and then suddenly uh, multi-word stage where kids produce entire phrases. So how do we measure development? How do we decide uh, not in what stage a kid is? Well, um, in the literature <clears throat> the kid's age is usually reported in years and months. So a child, and in brackets, 2.10 is two years old and 10 months. Um, there is a measure called MLU, mean length of utterance. So you transcribe everything a child says across a given day, and then you count how many of these utterances are one word utterances, two word utterances, multi word utterances, and you compute a mean. Yeah. Or you could look at the size of the lexicon, the number of different words that a child produces across a certain yeah, span of time. A little bit problematic, of course, because the child inevitably knows a whole lot of more words than it actually produces, but nonetheless, it's a useful predictor of how far along a child is in its language development. <clears throat> Let me say a few more things about the babbling stage. Early babbling involves uh, a sound that is called cooing. Yeah? Um, and this often happens in a stimulus response kind of uh, environment where the mom prompts the baby and also produces baby-like sounds and uh, uses motheries. Yeah, I'll talk a bit about motheries, perhaps. Um, 
<clears throat> and uh, for this, the <clears throat> child needs certain discrimination ability. So it listens out for the sounds that the mom produces. <clears throat> um, okay, so these uh, distinctions here for later babbling, of course that's approximate, that differs a bit across different languages, but nonetheless you can take it as a rough guide to the babbling stage. So with around three months babies are cooing and cooing single syllables, then later uh, these repeated consonant chains of ba 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 la 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 that kind of thing um, develops at five months uh, babies vocalize when they inspect toys or they imitate certain sounds that they hear at six months um, that's when babies become really expressive yeah when they vocalize pleasure and displeasure and uh, later still there is vocal play, uh, so reduplication of syllables, you know, where you can see that the baby tries out things and has some pleasure deriving from that vocal play. Okay, the one word stage. <clears throat> one problem, yeah, one puzzle is how does the baby identify words from the continuous stream of speech? <clears throat> see that there are construction workers and they they should be going home soon I hope well okay no noise just now how do the children identify words from the continuous stream of speech uh, there are different cues that they can exploit one of course is stress so uh, when I hear a stressed syllable I might interpret that as the beginning of a word. Um, another cue might be when I hear the word within a carrier phrase or a pivot schema that I already know. Okay, I'm gonna make a pause here because this is really getting on my nerves. Okay, I think the construction workers are taking a break, so I will continue. Um, so another strategy to identify words would be to look out for pivot schemas or carrier phrases that I know and then um, I'm able to identify the thing that occurs in the, uh, in the variable slot of that pivot schema as a word. So if I know look at the x as a pivot schema I can identify the thing in the x slot as a word. So <clears throat> even if I don't know the word panda but I know the look at the x schema, I can listen to, oh, look at the panda and infer that panda must be a word. Right. Third, of course, I could look out for pauses in the stream of speech, but most words really don't have pauses around them, so this is a really weak criterion as a cue for wordhood. Right. But all of these highlight word boundaries and help the child identify words. <clears throat> Um, talking about phonological development a bit. Some sounds are acquired earlier than others. Some sounds seem to be easier to acquire than others. And um, for instance, uh, a T is easier to pronounce than a CH um, because it's easier motorically speaking. Yeah? Just saying a T um, is less complex than CH, which is a sequence of two sounds that involve a T. Um, what makes a sound easy? It could be ease of production, but it could also be ease of perception. So, uh, for instance, with a P, I can observe how an adult speaker produces a P, namely with lip closure, yeah, P. <clears throat> so that makes it easier for me to copy, to imitate that behavior, and so I can learn something like P earlier than say g yeah a g comes out of the adult's mouth but how they do it nobody really knows yeah and it happens further back in the mouth um so young children simplify the sounds of adult language and usually this means that they're either omitting sounds 
or their substituting sounds. So let me talk a bit about omission and <coughs> substitution. Uh, with consonant clusters, several consonants in one in a row, there's usually reduction going on. So young children don't say stop, they say top. They don't say bring, they say bing. They don't say sleep, they say seep. Uh, they don't say bump, they say bum or bup. Yeah. So one of the consonants is omitted. <clears throat> unstressed syllables. When you have long polysyllabic words, the unstressed syllable typically goes out the window. So banana becomes nana, granola becomes nola, potato becomes dato. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, but not everything is um, omission. Some things also get substituted. So the child produces something else than what is there in adult speech. So some consonants, for instance, may become voiced. So instead of toe with a voiceless T, they say do. Instead of pig, they say big. Instead of pie, they say by. Um, why does this happen? Well, the vowels that immediately follow the consonants, they're of course voiced. And so it's difficult to have this contrast between a voiceless sound and a voiced sound. The voicing so spreads, so to speak, from the vowel to the uh, preceding consonant. But sometimes there's also devoicing, and this typically happens word finally, where you finish a word yeah, or finish an utterance. So instead of bed, you say bet. Instead of knob, you say knob. Instead of bib, uh, you say bip. <clears throat> okay. Um, one phenomenon that you observe really regularly is called stopping. So for instance, when you have a complicated sound like the interdental voiced fricative, the, yeah, that, there the kid says that. Um, if you have a nasal like jam, um, <clears throat> the kid might stop both the j and the m and have dab. <clears throat> and with jump, same thing, dab instead of jump. Um, the other way around, so to speak, would be to replace sounds like R and L yeah, with, with glides. So instead of rabbit, it would be wabbit. Instead of light, it would be yite. <clears throat> um, another process is called fronting. Mm, front consonants are easier to easier to perceive for the child and so the child will use these as replacements for consonants that are harder to perceive yeah the velar sound in uh, give or in cat or the uh, fricative in shoes um, they are fronted to div tat and sues <clears throat> okay i think a final uh, phenomenon here, consonant harmony. When there's a word with different consonants in the same word, um, kids will simplify this and just use the same consonant twice. So instead of doggy, they'll say goggy, yeah, using the g twice, or doddy, having the d twice. Um, with a word like self, it would be felf, so that the f appears twice. <clears throat> That much about phonological development. Now, if we take a look at morphological development, this is something that happens once the one word stage has been uh, surpassed, has been mastered. So, early words are learned as chunks without internal morphological structure. You learn something like noodles and are not aware that the final s is a plural s. This only comes later. And um, the awareness of morphological rules, the awareness that there is word formation, has been famously demonstrated in the WOG study, in the WOG test. And I've told you about this a couple of times. So the idea would be that you present children with a um, thought-out word like WOG. Yeah, it's not a real word, that's a made-up word. And you tell them, okay, this is a WOG. Now there's another one, there are two of them. There are two, and the kid says, WOGs. 
Okay, they've mastered the plural rule. Or you give them a picture of a man uh, balancing a ball on his nose and you, know, you tell them this man knows how to zip. Yesterday he zipped. That kind of thing. Right, what about lexicon and semantics? Um, <clears throat> there are certain curves of you know, uh, vocabulary size. And of course, they're different for different children. But just to give you a broad approximation of um, what kids do, many kids by 18, age 18 months have a vocabulary of around 50 words. It could be 20, it could be 3, it could be 100. Yeah? But it's likely not 2,000. Yeah? And it's not zero either. By age 6, they have a vocabulary that is well over several thousand words. So that's a vocabulary that allows you to talk about the world in very fundamental terms. Right. What are common semantic errors that kids make? There are two types uh, that I want to discuss. One is called overgeneralization errors. So you apply a term and also use it for things that don't belong in that category. Or you have undergeneralization, which is a little less obvious, a little harder to detect. So let me talk about overgeneralization errors. Children frequently use their early words in reference to entities that would not be covered by the adult word. So they use doggy for a cow, for instance. Um, overgeneralization errors of this kind are usually based on physical similarity, that is similarities in shape, in size, in texture, in motion, sound, and so on and so forth. So kids say daddy to refer to all adult males. They use ball to refer to apples, oranges, eggs, anything that's round, basically. And they use fly for anything that's small, you know, specks of dirt, small insects, your toes, breadcrumbs, the works. Right. So coming to an end here, we've covered lots of stuff in this video. So let me just briefly go over the main ideas. Um, the leading question of um, the linguistic study of language acquisition really is how is it that kids learn language this early and this effortlessly? And uh, an important notion in this regard is the critical period hypothesis, the idea that there is a time window during which language learning is much easier than later in life. Um, there are usage-based theories, theories that hold that language use, the input, the stuff that you hear, allows you to learn a language. And there are nativist theories that insist on there being a language acquisition device, something language specific that is hardwired into your brain. Uh, I talked about three different theories, namely behaviorism, universal grammar, and sociocognitivism. I talked about the poverty of the stimulus argument, the argument that the input is so poor, so deteriorated, that it would be impossible to learn language from it. Now, I've also argued that this poverty of the stimulus argument has been shown to be empirically false. <clears throat> I've talked about pivot schemas, young children's grammatical constructions. I've talked about sociocognitive skills, notably joint attention and intention reading. And uh, I've talked about different stages of linguistic development, the babbling stage, the one-word stage, the two-word stage, the multi-word stage. And lastly, I talked about a specific kind of error, namely overgeneralization errors. All right, that's it for today, and I'll see you next week.